first speaker was the winner of the OR Society's doctoral award, in fact in 2016, for a, uh, a thesis called Modelling for Healthcare Policy. Um, his name is Dr Itamar Megiddo, who I will introduce, he'll come up in a moment. Um, Dr Megiddo is a Chancellor's Fellow and Assistant Professor in the Department of Management Science at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, and his research focus is on improving evidence-based decision-making and resource allocation in healthcare policy, as is reflected in his award-winning thesis. Uh, his main body of work integrates study of disease, health systems, and economic modelling to evaluate impact and design of policy and strategy. And he's particularly interested in improving agent-based modelling of healthcare systems in low- and middle-income countries. Um, Dr. Megiddo's award-winning thesis focuses on this use of uh, agent-based modelling to inform healthcare policy, but it also includes elements of ecological modelling, economic evaluation, and game theoretic analysis, uh, which demonstrates Itamar's ability to draw on techniques and insights from different scientific domains and integrate them through modelling as part of a problem-solving process. Indeed, one of the comments from the external examiner was that Itamar displayed mastery of several fields of study through his thesis. Each of these fields is usually a topic of a single PhD thesis, so it's highly impressive that Itamar's thesis brings them together in a coherent body of work. And his work has the potential to make substantial contributions to both operational research and to improving human health worldwide. There are four published papers based on work reported in the thesis, with a fifth paper currently under review, or is it now published? Now published. It's moving fast. And two further published papers resulting from extensions of the research. Now, how he's going to combine all this into a 25-minute talk, I, I'm not so sure, but, you know, that's his challenge, not mine. Um, so I, let me just introduce Dr. Itamar Megiddo, first of all. Dr. Megiddo. Now, before I ask him to speak, I should point out that uh, he didn't have the opportunity to receive his award at the time that uh, the award was announced. So it's my great pleasure to uh, present the award to him now. And uh, stop with this. The big one. This one goes back to the OR Society, but he has a, he, he has a small version that, to take away with him. But that's the one that we want him to post for. There's the certificate. Thanks, man. Thank you. So let me first take this opportunity to thank the OR Society for the award, uh, as well as for the opportunity to speak to you. And as was mentioned, I'm going to be talking about agent-based modeling for economic evaluation, and in particular in the Indian context. And this was a large part of my dissertation. So my dissertation, again, as was mentioned, was, was called Modeling for Healthcare Policy. And it produced, at this point, five publications. And it was supervised by Professor Alec Morton, who I work with today in the Department of Management Science in Strathclyde University, as well as by Professor Ramanan Laxmanarian, who I've worked with for a good number of years and continue to do work with as well. The dissertation involved a number of different topics uh, in modeling for healthcare policy, starting off with, with explaining the implications of the decisions that uh, modelers are making as they're building the models, and the implications also of the intent of their models and the goals of their models towards what the different choices they're making, uh, or how the different choices they're making are going to impact the modeling. Uh, the, beyond that introduction, the dissertation involves a number of different models at different scales and different levels. So starting if we look at the first paper there, so that's at the pathogen level. So looking at the interaction of different strains of bacteria and the competition between them. But then it goes on to the national level, so looking specifically at India and doing a modeling for an economic evaluation for India there. And the third paper is, as was mentioned, involves a game theoretic framework to it, looking at actors at a global level. So trying to understand how vaccination policy 
how it impacts other countries, neighboring countries around you, and how also we can potentially improve uh, vaccination coverage in, in regions by creating a cooperative agreements that provide the right incentives for countries to be part of those agreements. But I'm going to be focusing on the next set of three papers, so the bottom three here, which all involve agent-based modeling in India. Uh, and they involve a model that we are call India SIM, which is a model which is developed as part of this dissertation. In these papers, uh, we look at public financing of epilepsy uh, using an agent-based model. We look at uh, vaccination uh, with a uh, rotavirus vaccine, which protects against diarrheal diseases, as well as uh, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine in the last paper over there. And we'll talk a little bit more about what the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine protects against. There's also a couple of other papers that have since been uh, uh, published as well that are using the model or build on the model, extending it, looking at how we implement or how we build infrastructure to provide, uh, in, uh, to provide water and sanitation uh, to reduce the disease burden in terms of diarrheal diseases, as well as looking at how community healthcare workers uh, can be used to provide in rural regions in India uh, healthcare packages to the community there. The work was also contributed to DCP3, which is the Disease Control Priorities Project, which is a Bill and Melinda Gates funded project that was published approximately a year ago. So it published nine volumes uh, that were published by the World Bank at the time. So the motivation for this work is working for a good number of years in health economics and looking at uh, economic evaluation of uh, healthcare interventions and policies, you see that in economic evaluations, we often don't consider the complexities that are part of the healthcare system. And talking in this room, it might be obvious to you, or it probably is obvious to you, that the healthcare system and healthcare more broadly, uh, or health more broadly, is a complex system. Uh, nonetheless, in health economic evaluations, they, we typically assume, as in other economic uh, other economic evaluations, we assume that individuals are rational and we assume that the system is not necessarily complex. It's a simple system where we have prescribed coverage levels. So for example, if we're looking at vaccination coverage, we assume that there's going to be 80% coverage or 100% coverage or whatever that vaccination coverage is without really discussing how we get to that 80% or how we get to the 100%. So we talk a lot about the what treatments or vaccines or preventative measures, what uh, uh, measures are the ones that we should promote, but not really how we get there. And that could lead to providing uh, suggestions that are not actually necessarily feasible, or potentially we need additional investments to actually achieve that we don't account for in economic evaluations. And this is particularly true in global health, where we often do not consider these, and the context is particularly important since we have demand side and supply side constraints that are going to mean that a lot of uh, the uh, a lot of the interventions and policies are not going to be possible unless we provide additional investments in these uh, interventions or alongside these interventions and policies that can overcome these constraints. And that is especially true also because we don't have a lot of data in low and middle income countries. So we often take data from randomized control trials in high income countries and assume that the same data applies in these low and middle income countries. That means we're assuming that the interaction between the population and the healthcare system is similar. We're assuming that the biology is similar, of the population is similar, and we're assuming that things will play out in a similar way in these countries. And that is not necessarily something that is true and could lead to misleading recommendations. This is also becoming increasingly important uh, with the uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, coming out in 2015 that, 2015 that the UN has adopted and countries around the globe have adopted. So they call for universal health coverage, which means that people everywhere should have access to treatments, to medicines, to vaccines, uh, as well as to financial risk protection, which means that if they have health shocks, that should not lead to them to go into poverty. So with the universal health coverage and the SDGs, there's been an increasing demand for these types, uh, for, for economic evaluations in these countries. And yet we miss a lot of the context 
when we do these evaluations. So our goal was to develop a model that does consider the context. So that a model that can consider how we implement interventions, not just what interventions. Model that can consider what strategies we should use when we're implementing the interventions. Should we vaccinate potentially specific parts of the country, target specific health technologies in specific areas or specific groups of the population, and how that will impact the overall outcome at the population level. Also, we wanted to have a data-driven model. So this is supposed to be a decision support tool, which has implications for its validity. It can be just a theoretical model, but we had to have data driving this model as well. And we wanted to keep it sim as simple as possible, at least initially. So you've all heard of the KISS principle. I did not include the last word of the KISS principle there, since I wasn't sure if that was OK over here. But uh, generally, we wanted to keep things as simple as possible, at least to begin with. And then as we learn more about the healthcare system, introduce the complexities of the uh, healthcare system, and specifically of the Indian population in the healthcare system, as well as introduce uh, new interventions. So building models on top of our base model, looking at new interventions, new policies, looking at new diseases. So we wanted to have a simple a baseline model that we could then follow on and extend. And we also wanted to look across a range of distributions. So we want to look at the health impacts, also the economic impacts and the cost to, to the government, the cost to households as well. What is the financial risk protection to households? Potentially households might have to borrow to cover some of the shock health events uh, that uh, occur in the households. And that could lead them into a cycle that is difficult to get out of. And we wanted to do this across a range of uh, distributions of in the, uh, across the population because for this, uh, or one of the main reasons for that is that also the distributional impact of economic evaluations is becoming more important uh, together with the uh, sustainable development goals where it lists that as a factor as well. So we wanted to look at the gender uh, impact of uh, our, of our uh, interventions and policies, look at how things were occurring in rural relative to urban populations, also geographically across the country, and also across the wealth distribution as well. Now, I'm sure a lot of you in here already know what agent-based modeling is, uh, but for anyone who doesn't, I'll just give a quick definition. And uh, the, this is, there's a lot of different definitions, but this is a definition I like. So it's a bottom-up modeling approach in which the system's behavior emerges from actions and interactions of autonomous agents with each other and the environment over time. So we have autonomous agents, which means that they're making decisions within their model. Their actions are not prescribed. It's usually if-then rules, sometimes with simple heuristic rules. Sometimes they're more complex, data-driven in some way. They might be based on utility and so forth. And they're act, uh, interacting with each other as well as with the environment. So those are the three main components of an agent-based model. The agents, the environment, and that interaction. And then bottom up, we have emergence that leads to population level patterns and outcomes. Now, uh, there's different, so with agent-based model, we typically do take an experimentation approach and look at different sort of simulations of different scenarios and see, do sort of what if analysis. What if we introduce this new policy? What if we introduce this uh, new intervention? What the outcomes will be? There's various different ways we can uh, use an agent-based model. We concentrate in this model on using it as a decision support tool, but also, of course, as a guiding tool for data collection, since agent-based modeling, as a lot of you probably know, can incorporate a lot of detail. And that means that we can also test out what detail is important. And that is particularly useful in global health, where a lot of times we might be missing the data that we need. So we can guide what, where we should invest money and which areas we should collect more data. Now, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on the agent-based model that I was talking to you about, the NDSM. And the good thing about talking about agent-based models is when you explain things at the micro level, talking about the agents and such, it's a pretty simple explanation. It doesn't involve complex mathematics. It involves if-then rules and such. So it's pretty simple to get across, even if I were talking to a room with people who are not or are experts. The difficult part is talking about it in 20 minutes. So you probably, you are probably not going to, based on this 
uh, one presentation believe necessarily that this model is valid. So if you have questions, obviously ask them. You can ask them after, or we can continue talking about this later as well. So uh, the model that we've developed, we call it NDSM, and it looks at prioritization of uh, healthcare policies and interventions in India. It is representative of the population at the district level. And over there, we see a map at the district level uh, of the various districts in India. And the work was a collaboration, of course, with several different subject matter experts. Uh, the subject matter experts differed depending on what model we were looking at specifically, if we we're looking at a model for vaccination or a model for building infrastructure. But it was a collaboration with those subject matter experts as well as with policymakers. Uh, and also it was based off of household surveys and also information from the literature. Again, depending on what specific model we're looking at. So sometimes we're looking at a model for uh, building out infrastructure. Sometimes we're looking at a model for using community health care workers. Each one of those I would consider a different agent-based model. They're all built on top of a base level model, which is the model I'm going to describe to you very shortly. Uh, but they're all different models involving different groups of people uh, that worked on them. So the model environment is patch-based. Each patch represents either a rural or urban area. The level of detail or the, uh, the level of detail that each area represents differed by model depending on the type of questions we're talking about. So they might represent a district, rural district area or rural state, or maybe at a lower level depending on what the questions we're asking are. Each patch has a set of healthcare facilities, and these healthcare facilities are described by their quality, and they're described by potentially the prices of treatments or what treatments are available in that healthcare facilities, as well as a number of other factors. And they also have households, which are described by their socioeconomic characteristics, their distance from various different healthcare facilities, and they're linked to a number of healthcare facilities as well. Uh, and the characteristics that the households, uh, that describe the households are all characteristics that are going to be relevant to some part of the decision making process as well. So for many of the models or submodels within the overarching model, the household is the decision making unit. Uh, for example, in terms of should people in the household seek care and where they seek care, that's a household level decision because the data that we have is at the household level for that. Uh, also, for example, in the population model, so how births occur as well, that is also a household level decision model. And each household has a set of individuals. So you can think of the household serve as a meta agent there. And the individuals are described by their sex, their gender, and different attributes that are specific to their health state, depending on the specific model we're talking about. And they are sort of interacting within the environment. If we're talking about an infectious disease model, then potentially they're uh, walking around and coming into contact with each other and that leads to infection and the spread of the disease. In most cases, what I've described to this point, those are the different entities within the model. In some cases, I just, uh, such as with pneumococcus, where the strain dynamics are important, we also have the, uh, we model at the pathogen level as well. So looking at the competition uh, between different strains of pneumococcus is going to be important also if we're looking at a model that is vaccinating only against some of those strains because of competition that might lead to an increase in the prevalence of some other strains. So in some cases we model also at that level. All of these are decision-making units or agents in the model or some, or some of them like the pathogens are not necessarily in every model but to some extent all of these make decisions within the model. Uh, households, individuals, and healthcare facilities. So I talked a little bit about the decisions that households and individuals make. Healthcare facilities may decide whether to prescribe a treatment or what treatment to prescribe, again, depending on the model. I'm gonna briefly talk about a couple of examples. Uh, one is about the rotavirus, both of them are vaccination related. Uh, the first one is about the rotavirus vaccination, which, which protects against diarrheal diseases. And the second is about pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which protects against diseases such as pneumonia, meningitis, as well as otitis media and others as well. Uh, they're both part of, or the intention, they're both not, were not at the time when we did the analyses, part of the universal immunization program. 
uh, but the intention was to look at incorporating them in the universal immunization program, and which, which targets 27 million under uh, newborn every year. So it's a very big immunization uh, program. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of complexity to applying that immunization program or to providing it. Uh, the rotavirus vaccine I mentioned protects against diarrheal diseases, which ca and, it, and it causes approximately 100,000 uh, deaths each year, a little over that, under five-year-old deaths, and similarly with the pneumococcal vaccine as well. Uh, just to give some sort of idea about the types of results that we looked at, I'm not going to go into detail into these results. Uh, but you see here in this example of, uh, in the plots here in this example, we have three different interventions. The, this is looking at the rotavirus vaccine. And in the first intervention, that's just introducing the rotavirus vaccine at the same levels as the diphtheria pertussis tetanus model. So we assume that the same households that are already vaccinating for that, va using, for that vaccine at the same time also, because they have the same vaccination schedule, also vaccinate for the rotavirus vaccine. In the second uh, one, we increase the vaccination coverage and also look at some other vaccines, uh, but we're increasing it randomly. So this is sort of like assuming a homogeneous coverage increase of the, uh, in, within the model. So this is not considering potentially some of the strategies that we might think about how we might want to target specific areas or, or something along those lines. In the last strategy, we're targeting, we're more going towards targeting uh, specific areas so in this case, in this example, it's areas that are already covered to a lower extent, but we can think about also covering areas that have higher disease burden or where the areas that are hubs for the disease that could uh, reduce the burden at a quicker rate if we target those areas. But we, in these, we're looking at the rural and urban divide. So we're looking at the top plot. We have the, sorry, the proportion of vaccination across these, uh, across rural and urban the rural and urban divide. And in the middle one, we're looking at the out-of-pocket expenditure. So that is a measure of the financial risk protection to households. So the out-of-pocket expenditure averted there. And in the bottom one, the death averted. So that is some sort of health measure. We also looked at these geographically. So looking at the outcomes across the country, depending on how we, uh, what strategy we use in terms of vaccination and where we prevent the uh, highest amount of death, where we uh, pr reduce the financial burden on households to the greatest. On the right, what we have is a money metric value of insurance, and that is also financial risk protection measure, uh, evaluating the willingness to pay of households to avert the health expenditure, so the health shock expenditure uh, in the case that they have health shocks. In this uh, table here, we're looking at things across the wealth distribution. Again, similar. Uh, outcomes uh, to what we were looking at before, death averted, out-of-pocket expenditure averted, and money metric uh, value, value. But we're looking at the wealth distribution, and the values here are means for each, uh, each uh, quantile of the west, or quintile of the wealth distribution. So we're looking at the poorest and the richest, but as well as the entire distribution there. So, this, so just to summarize the contributions and conclusions, so the work I did is, builds an ABM that contextualizes interventions, tells us a little bit about the how in addition to the what, and looks at whether these interventions are feasible or what additional investments we might need to make when we're implementing these interventions. Also considers the complexities that are often ignored. Uh, this also provides a, in, can, can be used and has been used to look at providing insights into the interaction between the population and the healthcare system, so the dynamics there. So we use the model also to look at what makes sense in terms of the rules at the micro level, given what we're seeing at the macro level patterns of outcomes. Uh, also, we provide projections of policy impacts to India. And actually, the rotavirus paper, we had the opportunity to present that work to the committee that later made the decision to introduce the rotavirus vaccine in India back in 2016. Uh, and the pneumococcal uh, vaccine as, was actually published just after the, the vaccine, the pneumococcal vaccine was introduced there as well. Uh, also provide some insights into pneumococcal disease dynamics. So that's the first paper I talked about, which I didn't really discuss in detail here, but look at what is the impact on a population 
consider when we consider the competition between different pneumococcal, uh, pneumococcal strains. And lastly, insight into the actors on a global scale. So looking at the vaccination uh, of uh, different diseases, in particular measles across a global scale and trying to understand how different actors on the global scale act. So thank you very much and I'm happy to take any questions.